Tacoma, Washington, the city of destiny. Nestled between the soaring mountains of the Cascades and the deep blue waters of the Puget Sound, Tacoma is a vibrant, beautiful community. The economic engine of the South Sound and a vital port in the worldwide shipping industry, Tacoma is home to a diverse collection of neighborhoods and people. The city is composed of eight major neighborhoods, New Tacoma, the North End, South Tacoma, Central Tacoma, Northeast Tacoma, the South End, the East Side, and the West End. Each of these is then made up of smaller neighborhoods, districts, and enclaves. Block by block, street by street, even house by house, the neighborhoods each have a history of their own. This is the first 100 years of that story. The story of a city, its neighborhoods, and its people. A story that we will start from the very beginning. The lands we call New Tacoma, from the eastern side of the Tide Flats, west to L Street, and bordered to the south by I-5, possess a diverse, rich history. Housing the heart of the city and its economic base, New Tacoma is also the site of the first communities known to exist in our city. The first to inhabit these lands were Native American people. At least two distinct races of Native Americans lived here. The Shootsie speakers are the same people we have today in the Puyallups, but there were also the people that came before. The Waukeshans, who were a, a, almost a prehistoric people, um, uh, mysterious, referred to by the later Indians as the people who came before, uh, the lookers, I mean, a, a very mystical kind of people. They established, I think, early on, partly because I think of the existence of Mount Rainier is an active volcano and, and being witness to eruptions of Mount Rainier and the effect of pyroclastic flow right down into the harbor. So very early on we became the harbor of phantoms and this place native people tended to be in residence at the mouth of the Nooksack. At the mouth of the Puyallup was a place of retreat, you know, a place of um, contemplation, a spiritual place to go to. We know that a major village was located along what is now called the Foss Waterway, with smaller villages scattered throughout the Tide Flats. It was a time when the Puyallup flowed into the Foss and the hills stood tall with timber. It was that timber which attracted white settlers. The first settler to make his home here was Nicholas de Lynn, a Swedish immigrant who in 1852 built a sawmill along the bay at the mouth of Gallagher Gulch, now Dock Street and Puyallup Avenue. Other families and missionaries followed, but in 1855, all settlement was halted for 10 years when the Puyallup and the Nisqually Indians joined together to oppose the Medicine Creek Treaty. With the lowlands in dispute, settlers began to take up residence on the hill overlooking the Tide Flats. Much of this land, which includes all of downtown Tacoma, was the Peter Judson land claim. Judson and his wife used their 321-acre claim as a wheat and oats farm. Little did they know that in a few short years, their claim would be one of the most valuable in America. And there were people like uh, Peter Judson, and that, that, he's one of the early ones. And uh, they were in the main farmers. Well, 
Uh, if you know anything about Tacoma soil, you know there's not much topsoil here and you have to, to grow grain or hay. Uh, and so they eked out an existence, really. And then, then the next wave were the speculators. Hey, there's going to be a railroad coming through here. Sure as can be. And we've got, if we're lucky, we will have platted land where that railroad's going to go and we'll get to be rich. And of course, the biggest moment in early Tacoma history is the selection by the Northern Pacific Railroad uh, of Tacoma as the terminus. Uh, in 1874, at that, uh, that period, 1874 uh, to 1894, is the golden age of Tacoma. The railroad began to develop the town site directly above the terminus. The first streets ran westward along the hills and south to the Hawthorne neighborhood. By the late 1880s, a variety of businesses and industrial activity was taking place in the Hawthorne area. With the railroad came the people. William B. Blackwell and his family were one of the first to arrive in Tacoma by train. Mr. Blackwell built the first hotel in New Tacoma and prospered very well. Another who prospered was Thea Foss. Following her husband out west, Thea made the eight-day journey by train with her three children in tow, one only an infant. Living in a floating home on the city waterway, she struggled to get by on her husband's carpenter wages. But Thea was resourceful. A uh, legendary story about her buying a, a, tug, or, I mean, a little rowboat from one of the hobos down on the waterfront that decided to leave town and fixing it up, painting it green and white, and then selling it and making more than her husband made in the two, month, two weeks he was gone working out on the, uh, on the islands. So that kind of set their path, and in the years to follow as the boys grew older and built um, really the most prominent tugboat firm in the Puget Sound area, Foss Tug. The amounts of available land and the growth of new industries, jobs, and the beginning of a new, fresh community attracted people of all races and cultures who contributed to the development of the community, among them Germans, Japanese, Swedes, and African Americans. Horace Lawhorn not only owned a profitable real estate business in Tacoma, he also became Tacoma's first African American police officer. Uh, there were, in the early years in Tacoma, from the very beginning, a uh, wide spectrum of uh, different nationalities but, uh, and, and immigrants. The black community started the down by uh, Jazz uh, Alley, what it's called today, and, and then just surrounding them coming in the 1890s are the Japanese. And then, then came the uh, a wave of Italians. They were uh, above the Japanese on the, on the big slope going up the hill. Uh, then came the Germans, and then finally on top of the hill were the Scandinavians. What was significant was they weren't in, uh, grouped in four or five blocks at the, in a center. They were along the streets. Uh, for example, as I said, the Japanese were on C and D streets, and, and uh, that would extend maybe 16, 20 blocks. But the story of the Chinese in Tacoma is not a happy one. In 1885, a growing resentment of Chinese up and down the West Coast boiled over. In the course of a few nights, over 700 Chinese were forcibly loaded into trains by a mob and sent south to Portland. 27 people, some of them Tacoma's most prominent citizens, were indicted. All were acquitted. It was brutal. It was uh, shameful that the community would allow that momentum to build towards that and to have the combined political support of the local newspaper um, and, uh, and the mayor at the time. When we were a strong mayor form of government at that time, mayor council form, that, um, to have those two leadership elements in the community sort of um, literally carry the torches out in front um, was uh, uh, I don't know, it's, just, it's a tragic, tragic thing. As the economic boom brought by the railroad continued, the new Tacoma area developed rapidly. General J.W. Sprague, a Civil War veteran who had been superintendent of the railroad, helped organize the Tacoma Gas Light Company. Soon, streetcars made their way along the newly paved streets, 
and grand structures were built, like the Tacoma Theater, City Hall, and the Courthouse. The Washington Exposition came to town, and a beautiful new park, Wright Park, was created for the enjoyment of the people. But nothing matched the splendor and symbolized Tacoma's prosperity like the Tacoma Hotel. Built at the suggestion of General Sprague, the Tacoma Hotel was on the bluff overlooking city waterway, the Tide Flats, and Mount Rainier. It was one of the finest hotels north of San Francisco. It was between 9th and 10th on A Street facing the water. And for instance, it was uh, when people would cross America by a car. You'd always have to stop at the Tacoma Hotel and uh, pay your respects to the totem pole and in the 1880s to Jack the Bear who lived in a grotto on the uh, north side of the hotel. Aside from the St. Paul Mill and an occasional farm, much of Tacoma's tide flats remained undeveloped until World War I. Though some early dredging had occurred, the onset of the war saw a shift of Tacoma's working waterfront from Old Town to the tide flats. By Armistice Day, dredging, fill, and the rerouting of the Puyallup River helped create a versatile industrial area for shipping, shipbuilding, and other industries. By 1927, the City of Destiny was moving ahead with New Tacoma as its center. The Crystal Palace Public Market, as large as 10 markets of that day, opened at the corner of 11th and Market, offering everything needed by Tacoma's growing populace. There were 50 farmer stalls and there were 180 some other um, stalls for merchants to, to be in. It was three stories. It was a massive, I think the newspaper called it a mammoth market. And um, it was really a precursor to our, our major supermarkets that we have today. World War II helped bring us out of the Depression and into a new phase of growth as workers came to work in the shipyards, smelters, and mills. But for Tacoma's Japanese Americans, the war had a different impact. Centered around Commerce Street, the Japanese enclave had been present since the 1890s, but the executive order requiring Japanese relocation changed all that. Perhaps determined not to see Tacoma repeat the injustices the Chinese had experienced, Mayor Harry P. Kane fought against the order. Harry Kane stood right up, right after the announcement came out, said it's the wrong thing to do, was opposed to it. Um, he corresponded with uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, who came out here. He did it in an honorable way. He disagreed with the president on legitimate political, philosophical grounds. He was the only mayor of any city that was affected by relocation um, to stand up and be opposed to, to the Japanese being forced out of the city. But Kane could not win, and the look of New Tacoma would forever be changed. After the war, the new influx of military families once stationed at Fort Lewis and McCord, but who decided to stay, created a bustling downtown filled with shops and people. And well into the 1950s, New Tacoma continued to prosper. And though the errors of urban renewal hit this neighborhood hard, New Tacoma and its residents have shown through. It is that same spirit that continues today and is looking ahead to tomorrow. When we talk about the history of the North End, we have to start here, in the place we call Old Town. In 1864, a Quaker and former Union soldier from Indiana by the name of Job Carr, paddling his canoe along the shoreline, staked his claim at this site, which is now at the foot of North 31st and Carr Street. Others followed Carr's lead. In those early days, the North End was not much more than a collection of tents and small wooden structures. Some of the early people who came, there was the Swan and Riley, fish pickling and manufacturing of barrels works. And this guy named Swan and this guy named Riley down where Old Town is would catch salmon all over the place. And they would, they hired a guy named Chauncey Baird and Chauncey made barrels. And they'd pickle salmon and haul them off to San Francisco to sell. By 1873, it was generally believed that the Northern Pacific Tournaments would be Tacoma. But just where, nobody was certain, not even the railroad. Job Carr thought that surely it would have to be where he had located his homestead, so he began to organize a town. Looking toward the mountain that dominated the horizon for inspiration, Tacoma was born. With speculation running high about the railroad, 
Old Town became the focus of much of the activity in the area. Morton and McCarver typified many of those gambling on the location of the terminus. The first uh, big person to arrive in town, of course, was Morton Matthew McCarver before the railroad came and he was looking for a terminus for the railroad. So he arrived from, Cal from uh, actually from Oregon and uh, he was out trying to convince the brethren to put the railroad here because that was very important. Uh, there was a lot of shoreline, a lot of wonderful places maybe to put the railroad and every uh, wide spot on the road was looking for a, a site for the railroad to come. McCarver was not content to wait for the railroad to make its decision, so he began to build. The first public wharf in Tacoma is Old Town Dock, constructed in 1873 by McCarver in anticipation of the establishment of the Western Terminus. Until the advent of the dock, most freight for the area had to come in by wagon, by way of Stilicum. But with the dock built, considerable freight and passenger traffic arrived by sternwheelers and sidewheelers. Alas, the railroad didn't choose Old Town, but that didn't spill the end of the community. Timber was the industry that really got things rolling. Numerous sawmills, docks, and shipyards lined the waterfront, and ships from all over the world called. It was the men who manned these ships that brought the first significant number of immigrants to the North End. Often, sailors jumped ship and went to work in the lumber mills. Many came from the regions of Austria-Hungary, Slavonia, Croatia, Bosnia, Serbia, and Albania. But all the people generally became known as Slavs. In 1901, Slavonian Hall was built and became the social gathering place of the community. We talked at the beginning about ethnic neighborhoods, and that's almost all gone now. One can't say that about Old Town. It still holds an identity, a, a, a local nationalism, a pride, and, and it's there, it's so obvious. The neighborhood continued to grow, and the area developed a unique identity which differed from the residential areas which bordered along the new Tacoma town site. These newer neighborhoods were advertised as well-planned, pleasant environments suitable for the families that the railroad hoped to attract to Tacoma. Homogenous communities developed around Stadium High School, the present Annie Wright School, and Jason Lee Middle School. A similar community was also developed on Prospect Hill, located immediately to the west and overlooking Old Town. At the turn of the century, F.K. Weyerhaeuser asked George Long to come to the Puget Sound area to evaluate the economic feasibility of purchasing the remaining timberlands of the original Northern Pacific Railroad land grant. After looking over the area, Mr. Long presented a favorable recommendation to Mr. Weyerhaeuser, who afterward moved his major operations to Tacoma from the Midwest. George Long settled here and built his home on Prospect Hill. West of Old Town, Alan C. Mason, one of Tacoma's pioneer builders, began development of a new residential community. Now generally referred to as the Proctor District, this sloping area of trees, cliffs, gulches, and streams was frequented by Puget Sound Indian tribes. There was little development except for a few scattered homes and a horse racing track located near the site of the fire station at North 25th and Proctor. Proctor Street acquired its name from John C. Proctor, one of Tacoma's finest architects, who had one of the first homes in the area. Among his many accomplishments, Proctor designed the Washington State Capitol building in Olympia, now used by the Superintendent of Public Instruction. In order to attract more people to the area, Mr. Mason realized that a streetcar line was a necessity. He provided one in 1890 when he constructed the Point Defiance rail line from downtown to Point Defiance Park. Before the streetcar, it could take quite some time to travel to the park from New Tacoma. But now there was a more direct route, directly through Mason's new development. And aside from one minor obstacle, the trip was now quite pleasant. Uh, there used to be a stump at 26th and Proctor. Huge stump, probably the biggest stump ever, and they would have uh, lanterns on there so that uh, and people, uh, uh, so that the, the uh, trolley would uh, see them and slow down because they had to make a big swerve turn. And uh, also on one side of it, people would uh, tie up their horses to go downtown. They, uh, they would catch the uh, trolley going downtown to come back and get their horse. Mason donated the land for Tacoma's first public library near 43rd and Stevens, and also built the first bridge crossing Puget Gulch on Proctor, north of the commercial district. In those pre-Narrows Bridge days, coupled with the ferries, Mason's Bridge was a vital link between Tacoma and the Gig Harbor Peninsula and Vashon Island. In 1911, the Proctor business area consisted of only three stores, 
but by 1927, that number had swelled to over 50, including two movie theaters, the Blue Mouse Jr. and the Paramount, located in the building now containing Rainier Cycle. Academic institutions have long been an important part of the North End. Annie Wright, the Aquinas Academy, and George Washington Elementary provided educational foundations for many generations of North End families. Before the University of Puget Sound built its current campus in the 1920s, the school was located at the site of Jason Lee Middle School at Sixth and Sprague. Founded in 1888, Sixth and Sprague was the school's second location. Its first campus was located in New Tacoma at South 21st and I. Another college was also once present in the North End. Whitworth College opened its doors in 1890 in the vicinity of North 23rd and Stevens. In fact, the home of the president of Whitworth was the residence of Alan C. Mason. In the 1920s, after Whitworth College was moved to Spokane, J.P. Weyerhaeuser had the home torn down to make room for his own mansion, Hathaway Hall. Restaurants abounded throughout Tacoma, but perhaps the city's most cherished was the Top of the Ocean. Located along the waterfront near Old Town, the Top of the Ocean, with its unique design, played host to big-name bands and famous visitors but it was best known as a great place to eat. The place I miss more than anything else is the good old top of the ocean. Why? Because for a dollar on Saturdays, you could go in and have their smorgasbord. And I'm not talking about, you know, I probably had six pork uh, cutlets one Saturday. There was always a big salmon. You could take the biggest chunk of salmon you wanted. The North End seems to have changed little since its beginnings. It's still home to working families, and it still connects strongly to its roots. And it takes pride in its own history and its contribution to the city of Tacoma. The area we now call South Tacoma, with its busy streets and businesses and quiet residential neighborhoods, was once just a narrow valley that wound and flattened as it retreated from the shore. Its edges held large stands of oak and alder. In fact, in the northern area of the valley, the oak forest was so thick that Douglas fir was considered a weed by early loggers. Rumor among children was that the swamps in the area were actually an inlet of the Puget Sound and that once a pirate ship had sunk into their murky waters. As early settlements took hold in the Stilicum area, this land was used primarily for the grazing of cattle. Originally called Hunt's Prairie, the only signs of settlement were a horse and buggy route to Olympia and the rail line to Kalama. Part of the prairie line, it was the lifeline for the new city to the north, so development along the way was assured. All cities in the west, to one degree or another, are dependent upon the railroad, but few cities in the west are as purely a product of the railroad as we are. And uh, we really did arrive and appear with the arrival, with the coming of the Transcontinental. And that prairie line is that last closing line. It's like reading a novel and just being totally satisfied by the last line in a book or a poem that the prairie is that last phrase in the building of the Transcontinental. Southwest of Hunts Prairie was a huge peculiar tree whose trunk grew in a circular shape. The tree became a landmark and meeting place for Indians. This area became known as Manitou, which is an Indian term used for anything strange. The first white settlers in the area were John and Eliza Rigney, whose 1873 land claim was located near 64th and Orchard Streets. In 1888, the Oaks Edition was platted from 200 acres purchased from a local settler. In May of 1890, streetcar rails were laid the length of Center Street. That same year, Mrs. Walter Ball named the neighborhood for Oakland, California, because she liked that city. But by 1893, Oakland was not much more than a sawmill owned by John McGoldrick, located at South 38th and Tyler. But as the mill grew and attracted workers, so did the community. By 1899, a grocery store, druggist, and school were in the area. Tacoma's need for cemeteries led to the establishment of three cemeteries near Hunts Prairie, with Oakwood Cemetery being the oldest. Burials here were a matter of practical convenience. Once R.F. Radenbaugh put the Tacoma Puyallup Railway in place, it was popular to load the casket onto the streetcar for the trip to the cemetery, rather than take the rough and often muddy wagon roads. 
In 1891, the Northern Pacific decided to relocate its shops from the present-day Union Station to Hunts Prairie, which was renamed Excelsior when the post office was established. In 1896, the area was renamed again to Edison in honor of the great inventor Thomas Edison. But due to the existence of another post office named Edison in Skagit County, the name was changed again, this time to South Tacoma. In 1898, the United States declared war on Spain. Answering the call for volunteers, 12 regiments of the Washington National Guard from as far away as Spokane and Walla Walla mustered at Camp Rogers, which was located near 84th and South Tacoma Way. During World War II, the old site for Camp Rogers was even mined for lead and brass casings for the war effort. With the Northern Pacific shops located there, South Tacoma grew rapidly. The old Tacoma Olympia Buggy Trail was rechristened Union Avenue. As the railroad built homes for its workers, businesses grew along the avenue. The area was bustling with daily activity of a thriving community. At the turn of the century, bicycles became a popular form of transportation. South Tacoma was a favorite rest stop for travelers who rode the Cinder Trail running from Tacoma to Olympia. With so many people settling in the area, businesses, banks, saloons, and hotels flourished side by side with homes and churches. So many churches were being built along Warner Street that today it could even be called the Avenue of Churches. Like the rest of the growing region, the trolley was South Tacoma's link to downtown Tacoma. Heavily relied upon to take people to work, school, and shopping, the trolley system of 1900 was actually a collection of many different systems built by developers to attract people to new neighborhoods. But what many did not know is that the system was dangerously flawed. On the 4th of July in 1900, um, the normal operator of the streetcar line that ran from South Tacoma Way in over Nally Valley over a high trestle, 80-foot high trestle at um, Nally Valley and then connected and came on down into the downtown. The, the, the operator was on vacation, it was the 4th of July. It was 1900, so it was the turn of the century. It was a new millennium starting. It was like our millennium celebration. Everybody wanted to go downtown. Huge fireworks show, there were big battleships in the harbor. Um, kids were out of school. Everybody wanted to be downtown. Uh, the early morning cars coming in. Um, many more inexperienced operator, poorly maintained system, horribly overloaded. A car that probably should have been carrying something like 25 or 35 people probably had upwards of 100 people on it, people hanging on the outside, young men on the outside, families tucked into the inside. Started down the hill towards the trestle, it was a big elliptical bending bank trestle and um, the conductor lost control. The car started to run away, brakes failed, uh, car was picking up speed, people began jumping off as best they could, um, hit the high trestle and right at the steepest point, right on the bend, the car leapt off the trestle and took the tumble down below. Um, something like 45 people killed instantly. Uh, whole families wiped out. The worst streetcar disaster in American history up until that time, and I believe it's still one of the worst in North America, even to this day. In 1907, the neighborhood of Manitou Park was platted as the need for housing increased. The school started as a grouping of portables, and it wasn't until after World War I that a more permanent structure could be built. The Park District purchased five acres of land in 1915, and by 1919, Manitou Park was a favorite stopover for weary travelers headed north. The neighborhood stood on its own. When the circus came to town, it came to South Tacoma. When presidential candidates made a whistle stop, they stopped in South Tacoma. By the late 1920s, the area was still dotted with dairy farms, and most of the activity centered on the Northern Pacific shops. But the influence of the automobile changed all that. The establishment of Highway 99 through the heart of the area brought growth further south along South Tacoma Way. The motel became a new phenomenon along the roadside, along with cafes and coffee shops. The competition grew so fierce that a business would try most anything to attract customers. In 1918, Marcus Nally had founded Nally's Incorporated. In 1940, he built a large factory on a 17-acre site near the railroad line leading from downtown to South Tacoma. This area had long been developed as an industrial area, and many of Tacoma's manufacturing companies called it home. But when Mr. Nally moved in, 
From then on, this area would be referred to as Nally Valley. During World War II, troops flocked to South Tacoma's USO Club for entertainment and the sight of a pretty face. And after the war, many of these same men returned in search of jobs and a place to settle down. Housing construction was rapid and so typical of what the rest of the country was experiencing. Even a 1948 issue of Better Homes and Gardens featured a home from the Manitou neighborhood. The post-war boom brought America unprecedented prosperity. Nothing typified that prosperity like the automobile, and South Tacoma benefited from America's love with the automobile. It was the same post-war growth in South Tacoma that would lead to the construction of more schools. As these baby boomers matured, the need for schools intensified. In 1961, Mount Tahoma High School, which had been built on the site of the old swamp, opened as a testament to the modernism of the area. Today, the dairy farms are gone, and a new Mount Tahoma is rising and the vitality and spirit of South Tacoma and its residents continues to grow and shines as an example for the rest of Tacoma to follow. The history and growth of the central neighborhood spans nearly the entire history of Tacoma itself. As Tacoma made its humble beginnings along the shores of Commencement Bay, settlers staked claims throughout this area. Scattered farms and homesteads were the beginnings, but just as the railroad brought industry and business to downtown, it also brought the workers and their families to the rapidly growing city. In 1880, Tacoma's population was about 750 people. By 1890, it was over 40,000. It was quickly recognized that the top of the hill, with its close proximity to downtown and industry, and relatively flat terrain, was ideally suited for development. One of the early developers in the area was also Tacoma's first recorded African-American citizen, George P. Riley, who arrived in Tacoma during the 1860s. In 1869, he formed an association composed primarily of African-Americans and purchased 60 acres of land roughly in the vicinity of South K Street to Sprague Avenue. While formerly called the Alliance Edition, its more common namesake was less polite. Confusion of ownership of the land among the growing numbers of investors and heirs led to a large number of squatters in the 1890s, and it was not until after an expensive court battle that things were finally put back into order by Mr. Riley. Another well-known developer of the central area was Clinton Ferry. Mr. Ferry claimed to be the first paying passenger to arrive in Tacoma by rail. Whether true or not, Clinton Ferry was a busy man. Along with a number of developments in the South End, he platted an addition that had a unique feature. Instead of the normal grid pattern of most additions of the day, Ferry's addition had a small central park in the middle of the street. Dedicated in 1883, Ferry Park was Tacoma's first official park. Along a muddy logging trail, which later would be known as 6th Avenue, a robust logging operation and mill existed where Pine Street and 6th Avenue are today. The Menser Mill operated from about 1888 to 1890 until the land to the west of the city had been stripped of its timber. 6th Avenue was destined to be an area of commercial growth as the primary rail line ran its length down to about Orchard Street. Following the depression of the 1890s, boom times again returned to Tacoma and the central area. This time, the growth of the shipyard industry brought a new wave of settlers to the area in the form of European immigrants. Russians, Italians, Norwegians, Germans all began to settle in the areas bordered by K Street and Sprague and South 12th to South 19th Street. These enclaves became known as Little Italy, Little Russia, and so on. It was not uncommon at the time to have several blocks of families who could be heard conversing among themselves in a language other than English. Of course, when I was a little kid, we lived on 21st and Cushman in the K Street neighborhood. We never went to K Street. We hiked down the street maybe five blocks, me and my baby buggy, according to my mother, and we went to the meat markets in Little Russia, which was an enclave uh, down which is now gone. Uh, some of the buildings are still there because like people like to live together, to have something familiar because as people came to the new world from wherever, uh, that was a tremendous leap. 
and uh, they would try to be as comfortable as possible where they could speak their language. For a good part of its history, it was ethnic neighborhoods, and those ethnic neighborhoods were working people. They all hiked down over the, the uh, slope to, to, to jobs, and most of them were on the waterfront. This is a working waterfront community. Um, they worked uh, uh, as hard as they could to make the city a success. And, uh, we're at the, we're sitting at the table they set. The influx of families into the area meant an education was needed for their children. This was met by the construction of Bryan School. The central area also saw its African American community grow as well. One member of this community was Dr. Nettie Asbury. Dr. Asbury who arrived at Tacoma in 1890, was in all likelihood the first black woman to ever earn a doctorate in the United States. She founded the Tacoma chapter of the NAACP and was a founding member of the Tacoma Colored Women's Club. In 1893, the first brick house to ever be built in Tacoma was built in the central area. Another distinction for the central area was the building of the Tacoma Stellicum streetcar line, which ran along 12th Street as it made its way west to Stellicum. Built in 1890, the Tacoma Stellicum Line was the first interurban rail line in the United States. Nothing remains today except for the building, which was the original powerhouse for the line at South 12th and Proctor. In 1907, Tacoma Community House was organized to serve as a place for children to meet for entertainment and instruction. Through the years, it formed Tacoma's first kindergarten program, provided English classes to immigrant children, and in 1923 was a founding member of the Community Chest Organization, which is now known as the United Way. Baseball was a favorite pastime throughout Tacoma, but for the people of the central area, it was a passion. There were dozens of teams from the neighborhood alone, but when the central team was playing against another neighborhood team, it was not uncommon to find the fans from the central teams outnumbering the opposing team fans by a very large margin. By 1918, Todd Shipyards, located in the Tide Flats, found that there was not enough housing in Tacoma for its workers. So the company built Todd Heights as an affordable, comfortable community for its employees. But Todd was not alone in developing the area. In rapid succession, many additions seemed to spring up overnight as the demand for housing in the city increased. This growth also meant more schools were needed. In the 1920s, Jason Lee, Franklin, McCarver, and Stanley schools were all built to serve the growing population. Sixth Avenue also saw its business areas grow by leaps and bounds, with no end in sight. And despite the growth in the central area, there were still large areas of undeveloped land. Seeing an opportunity, Mr. Sam Allen and Mr. W.J. Dinsmore opened the Allenmore Golf Course in 1931. Promoting its proximity to downtown, Allenmore offered 18 holes of golf on a top-notch course for 75 cents. A favorite place for children to play in the central area was Hoodlum Lake. Before it was filled in to create the playfield of Franklin Park, Hoodlum Lake offered children a great place to cool off in the hot summer sun and to get in a quick game of hockey in the cold winter. World War II brought defense workers to Tacoma yet again, and more housing was needed in the central area. Following the war, as rations were lifted and the post-war housing boom added still more development, America's new passion, television, came to Tacoma. In 1953, KT&T signed on the air from its state-of-the-art studios on South 11th Street. Channel 11 carried a variety of national and local programming, including the Brakeman Bill Show, which ran each weekday for 20 years until 1974. And while TV seemed to take over as America's favorite pastime, the central area continued its love affair with baseball. In 1959, the U.S. Army was ordered in to clear the brush for a new and modern stadium and on April 16, 1960, the Tacoma Giants played the Portland Beavers in their season opener in the new Cheney Stadium. Cheney Stadium also played host when President John F. Kennedy visited Tacoma on September 27, 1963. Five weeks later, he would be assassinated in Dallas, Texas. Today, the Central neighborhood is still home to many working class families who make the trek to work down the hill each day and back home each night. And it's the strength and character of its residents that have carried the neighborhood through the decades and will certainly maintain it for the decades to come.
In the centuries before the arrival of white settlers, the beaches of Browns Point and Dash Point were favored among many Native American tribes for summer recreation. In 1792, Captain George Vancouver was searching the waters of Puget Sound for the Northwest Passage. On May 26 of that year, he explored the waters east of Vashon Island and set foot on the north shore of Browns Point for a noon lunch. Later that day, he and his men rounded what is now called Browns Point and into Commencement Bay. Vancouver later wrote the impressions of what he saw. This land is the place where people can come and uh, have a future. It's not only beautiful, but it will have a great maritime future. It's a wonderful couple of lines. You know, we talk about vision statements, we talk about objectives. Here, in 1792, he's saying, uh, okay, Tacoma, here's your, uh, you can see this beautiful spot. You, you've got a chance to make something of it and, and just keep the beauty of it, uh, the scenic beauty, but also develop it. And that, that is the, the task of future generations. Brown's Point was originally named Point Harris during an 1841 U.S. Navy expedition. Sometime between that year and 1877, both Browns Point and Dash Point received their names, perhaps to honor the men from one of the British expeditions that explored the area between 1846 and 1877. The Medicine Creek Treaty of 1854 designated the area of Northeast Tacoma and the Tide Flats as part of the Puyallup Reservations, but the treaty was often in dispute. At the urging of the Puyallups, the government finally surveyed the area and assigned plots of lands to individual Indians. In 1886, 167 patentees were issued to individual Puyallup Indians, with each receiving about 160 acres of land. During this time, a Native American by the name of Jerry Meeker was an advisor to the elected chief of the tribe. Jerry Meeker was born at Fern Hill. His father had taken the Meeker name from his employer, Ezra Meeker. Jerry Meeker was one of the few literate Indians on the reservation and was an indispensable asset to his people and the white settlers. While the Puyallups were originally not allowed to sell their allotments, they were allowed to lease them. In 1893, one enterprising Tacoma businessman by the name of Frank Ross acquired rights of way from several Indian owners and attempted to build a railroad. At the time, railroad rights of way could only be granted by Congress. Federal troops were dispatched from Vancouver to halt Mr. Ross. In response, the Indians stacked logs at the top of a hill on Brown's Point. When the troops approached, the Indians released the logs. Fortunately, no one was injured in the encounter, and the troops retreated. Eventually, the courts ruled against Frank Ross. After Washington became a state, the Puyallups were allowed to sell their land. This began to open up the opportunities for development of the land. But because of the inaccessibility of the area, Northeast Tacoma held no real industrial value. And even though its timber was of value, even getting it to the mills just across the bay was a challenge. In 1901, the residents of this area, at that time mostly Indian, voted for annexation into Pierce County from King County, thus setting the path for the area to become part of the city of Tacoma. The first Browns Point Lighthouse was built in 1903. As lighthouse keeper, Oscar Brown and his wife Annie became the first permanent white settlers in the area. Mr. Brown would service the lighthouse for the next 36 years. The second lighthouse, a concrete structure built in 1933, is now fully automated and is listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Between 1901 and 1907, Jerry Meeker, along with some business partners, acquired and plotted most of the land west of today's Eastside Drive. Called the Hyata Park Edition, Meeker named many of the streets after Indian names. In 1906, Meeker built his own home on Browns Point. Steamer traffic provided the only means of transportation to and from the points. In 1905, Captain Matthew McDowell, the owner of a transportation company, purchased and platted 80 acres adjoining the cove east of the lighthouse where George Vancouver set foot 112 years earlier. He called it Caldona Beach, where he built a large dock to moor his fleet of small passenger steamers. The first permanent resident of Dash Point was James Churchill, who built a grocery store and a dance hall at the point. Often called the mayor of Dash Point, he was the real estate agent for much of the land developments at the point as well as the Justice of the Peace. For both points, most of the development in the area was in support of summer vacationers who came from Tacoma across the bay. Soon a smattering of vacation tents and cabins began to line the shore. In 1914, Jerry Meeker built a public dock at Browns Point. 
It became a social gathering place for residents of the community, with Meeker hosting an annual salmon bake there for many years. By 1918, Northeast Tacoma was still really only accessible by boat. Nearly everyone and everything had to be transported across the bay. There existed some dirt roads into the area, but in the fall and winter they were nearly impassable. In 1920, the first modern road, Marine View Drive, Eastside Drive, was completed between Tacoma and Dash Point. And although there were a few mishaps, it provided access to automobiles. Now bus service was available four times a day to Tacoma. In 1927, Dash Point began to hold its annual summer festival called Hoop de Doos. Each year until World War II, residents and guests would gather for tug of wars, swimmings, and a wonderful meal. Besides becoming an ideal location for spotting enemy planes, the war brought growth to Northeast Tacoma. The influx of shipyard workers and their families to the area created a demand for housing close to the tide flats. New families settled in, attracted by inexpensive land and the quiet solitude of the area. In 1946, the first shopping center opened at Browns Point with a grocery store, hardware store, barbershop, and dry cleaner. And in the 1960s, the Cliff House opened and was instantly one of Tacoma's most popular restaurants with food and a view that is still unmatched. Today, many new homes dot the hillside of Northeast Tacoma and its commanding view of Commencement Bay and downtown Tacoma. The community continues to thrive and grow, but as it looks forward to the future, it has never lost sight of its past. The area of Tacoma, which we call the South End, was originally mostly prairie, with a few clumps of tall firs scattered about. In the early summer months, Indian women and children would often pick wild strawberries that grew here. Indian Henry Trail, which was the first road to Tacoma, followed what is now Park Avenue, M, and Sheridan Streets to a point near South 24th and Dock Street. Prior to settlers, the trail was used by both Indians and the Hudson Bay Company when traveling from Fort Nisqually to Commencement Bay. The first official road in Washington ran through what we now call Fern Hill, roughly following the path of South 84th Street. Originally a small trail leading to Puyallup, it was developed into a military road in 1853, which led from Fort Stillicum across Natchez Pass to army camps east of the Cascades. The road proved critical to the settlers fleeing the 1855 Indian War. And for the farmers of the Puyallup Valley, it was the most direct route for them to take their products to the only mill in the county, located at Lake Stillicum. Even though well-traveled, it really was not a place for a little boy in 1850. It would take two days to get from the farms of Sumner to uh, the Bird Mill. And then you'd wait in line until uh, the mill was ready to take your wheat, and they'd grind it up, then you'd take it home. Well, in one occasion, young Charles Ross was about 12, and they were coming from uh, their farm, and something happened. It was him and his papa. And the papa says, I gotta go. Now, the neighborhood, and this was the 1850s, was filled with dis discharged soldiers. Uh, people had been kicked out of the army. You know. Then we had, uh, shall we say, rogue Indians, Indians who uh, would not live on the reservation. They'd go off by themselves. Uh, we would have uh, foreigners of all kinds, uh, uh, groups that, that did not stay, such as the, uh, the Hindus and the Sikhs were here. Uh, in fact, the Hindu, uh, the Sikhs had a, were strike breakers at one time down here. So we had all these people wandering around with, you know, one chair. So here's little Charlie, who's 12, and he's got the oxen and the wagon, and he can't even get the, uh, the yoke off of them because he's too little. And these people keep coming by. And after a while, there's this Indian guy who comes by. He says, Charlie, what are you doing here? And Charlie says, well, Dad had to go off and do this stuff, and I'm here by myself. And he says, oh, no, you're not. He says, I'm here until your dad comes back because they're just not, this is not a nice neighborhood. So he and the Indian spent two or three days together uh, with the Indian protecting Charlie Ross and Charlie Ross's stuff until the father came back. In 1860s, George Washington Byrd homesteaded in the vicinity of these crossroads, and by the 1870s, he
he had developed a hop farm on his claim, near where Baker Middle School is today. At the time, a series of peat bogs ran roughly from South 112th Street north to Wapato Lake. The bogs proved too difficult for crop growing, but they were dredged for the valuable peat soil, which was used for the making of lawns in the rocky soils of Parkland and Lakewood. In 1880, the children of George Bird attended a school near Lakeview, four miles away. One day, a cougar tracked his daughters as they walked home. Concerned by this, Mr. Bird decided to build his own school. Originally known as Bird School, the name was changed to Fern Hill in 1883, a name that was soon applied to the whole community. To the north of Fern Hill, the township of Tacoma was growing rapidly. In 1885, the Tacoma Land Company cleared 100 acres and platted what is known as a sixth edition. Originally marketed as South Park, this area was centered on South 38th and Yakima. Soon other nearby developments, such as Central Park and Park Avenue opened. Not far away, near 36th and Pacific, the new City County Hospital was completed to serve the many people moving into the area. In 1888, R.F. Radenbaugh, who had been developing a rail system throughout the city, built a narrow gauge streetcar line which led from Tacoma along M Street to South 56th, where it turned toward South Tacoma. George Bird persuaded Radenbaugh to extend the line from South 56th to Fern Hill and even donated the land for the right-of-way and the powerhouse. The streetcar brought a boom to the South End. In 1888, a new Fern Hill School had to be built to accommodate the growing number of students. Watt McGee built the first grocery store at South 38th and Thompson in 1890, and that same year, Fern Hill established its first post office. Many of the steady stream of settlers to Tacoma soon found a home in the area. After the establishment of streetcar lines around town, Fern Hill decided it wanted to be annexed into the city, mainly to get streetcar fares reduced. At the time, a round-trip ticket in Tacoma only cost a nickel, but to Fern Hill it cost 15 cents. The streetcar company refused the nickel fare farther south than 64th Street. One day, as the conductor walked around to collect the extra fare, some passengers refused to pay they also refused to exit the streetcar. So the car was switched to a siding. As more cars reached 64th Street, passengers on those cars also refused to pay or to exit, and they too were switched off the main line. After two days, the streetcar company began to run out of cars. The company reached an agreement with the passengers to get the cars moving again, and eventually the court decided in favor of the passengers. In 1901, South Park was renamed Lincoln Park, by this time, businesses were flocking to the area along 38th Street, and homes were being built rapidly. In 1914, Lincoln Park High School was completed. Not only did the school symbolize the pride taken by the residents of the community, the school's completion was also the start of a crosstown rivalry with Stadium High School that continues even today. The Lincoln area continued to grow rapidly through the 1920s, with new homes being completed on the average of one each day. Businesses seemed to spring up overnight, Fern Hill grew as well, and by 1924, another Fern Hill school had to be built. Fern Hill was home to many businesses as well. In 1915, Belle Dennison began canning her homemade chili recipes for her friends. Its popularity grew so much that she and her husband Lee opened the Dennison Chili Plant that operated in Fern Hill from 1925 to 1938, when it was sold and moved to Seattle. The Depression hit everyone hard but it also brought development to the South End. For a long time, Wapato Lake had been an informal park for the people of the South End. And while the lake was a wonderful place to boat, its muddy and shallow bottom was filled with snags and other unexpected hazards. In 1938, the WPA completed the transformation of Wapato Lake into one of the most beautiful and most used parks in the city. The growth that World War II and the post-war economic boom brought to Tacoma didn't miss the South End. Nearby war and post-war housing benefited the Lincoln area greatly. In 1947, the construction of Lincoln Bowl in the old gulch next to the school was completed with a seating capacity of between 8 and 10,000. Ten years later, every one of those seats would be filled as a young rock and roller left his mark in Tacoma. In the early 1950s, tuberculosis was a serious problem. This led to the construction of Mountain View Sanatorium for tuberculosis patients. The facility was state-of-the-art for its time, 
but just after five years, the spread of the disease had been halted and closure was recommended. In 1958, it became part of Pierce County Hospital. Today, the South End is richer than ever in its heritage and its diversity. Its history and its residents continue to be a source of pride for the members of its community and for Tacoma as well. Long before white settlers, the east side of Tacoma was important to the original inhabitants of these lands. For the Puyallup and the Nisqually, the proximity to the river and the area's vantage point over Commencement Bay were ideal. Some archaeological evidence indicates that a significant Puyallup village may have been located along Swan Creek. In 1854, Territorial Governor Isaac Stevens negotiated the first Medicine Creek Treaty, which placed a great deal of this area into the Puyallup Reservation. For the most part, the area was left undeveloped, except for certain lands that were set aside for an Indian school, hospital, and cemetery. The cemetery is where a monument to Nisqually Chief Lashai now stands. His remains were relocated to the Puyallup Indian Cemetery when the Nisqually burial ground became part of Fort Lewis. Chief Lashai was a peaceful man with deep convictions who labored his entire life for peace, but when confronted with war, led his people into battle. At the end of the conflict, he was unjustly accused of murder. So they come down, come down and they see Leshai at a spot on Connell's Prairie where they are burning down a white man's cabin. Why? Because Eaton's Rangers burned down an Indian cabin. This is still Old Testament, eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. So this is where the story changes. They see Leshai there. This express then rides across Connell's Prairie, if you've ever been there. It's a wide open area. Leshai did not have a horse. He supposedly ran at the, around the edge of the prairie and got to the other side of the prairie and there in the bushes shot a Benton Moses and Joseph Miles and killed them. The army soldiers proved that he could not have been there. They did some measuring and all this good kind of stuff. But he was a leader of the dissident army. Well, they say, hang him, hang him, hang him, hang him because he murdered these people. His lawyers point out, who, by the way, were prominent local attorneys, said, no, no, this was a war. Anything he did in the war was, uh, it's a war. And they concluded that, uh, well, if an Indian kills somebody in a war, it's murder. If the white man kills somebody in the war, it's war. So Leshai languished in a slammer for a long time. And eventually, he was convicted twice of murder of these two, these two guys. And eventually was hanged. Um, and he said, being a good Christian, which he was, that he forgave everyone but the guy who lied about him, which was this other fellow, which August Val Valentine Kautz, who was an officer at Fort Stilgum, tells, never told a true story in his life. In 1884, the Tacoma Land Company established its first addition in the area. Consisting of over 600 acres, the addition was billed as convenient to downtown and possessed very desirable lots that ranged from $50 to $300. In 1887, the town of Bismarck was established in the area of what is today 64th and McKinley Avenue. Bismarck was named in honor of the German Chancellor Otto von Bismarck, who had become very popular with Americans following his defeat of the French in the Franco-Prussian War. Bismarck was a small lumber town centered around two mills and was the only significant development in the area until 1896. As with much of the rest of Tacoma, it was the railroad that brought growth to the east side. McKinley Avenue, then known as 8th Street, was much more of a rail line than a street, as the line ran from Tacoma out to the mills at Bismarck. The original first addition to Tacoma had also included land for a park. Without a formal name, for years it was known simply as East Park. But when President William McKinley died from an assassin's bullet on September 14, 1901, not only did the name of the park change, but also so did the identity for the whole area. The next day, Metropolitan Park employee Martin Hoblin is reported to have said, Boys, from now on, it's McKinley Park. The park board agreed. 
Shortly thereafter, A Street was changed to McKinley Avenue, and soon the entire area was known as McKinley Hill. With the rapid and continued expansion of the Northern Pacific Eastern Yards, the east side became a popular place for employees to settle. In 1904, the Northern Pacific Railroad established its own hospital on East Wright for the benefit of its own employees. Seeing an opportunity, a young man by the name of E.F. Gregory purchased much of the land around McKinley Park and in 1904 created the McKinley Park Edition. Determined to succeed, Gregory offered free streetcar rides for those interested in seeing the property. Lots sold at incredible bargain prices that made the area very desirable to the working class family. The city's expansion continued rapidly, with many additions following in quick succession. As the streetcar line continued south to the town of Bismarck, that community voted for annexation into the city. The east side of Tacoma was on the move, but in 1914, tragedy struck Bismarck. Fire broke out in the Comley Kirk planing mill. The fire soon spread to the Bismarck mill as flames engulfed nearby structures. Although steam engine fire companies arrived quickly, the fire was wildly out of control. In an attempt to remove some of the lumber-loaded freight cars, a locomotive was dispatched up the hill with about 15 volunteers aboard. As the engine moved between the burning stacks of lumber over hot rails and burning ties, the rails gave way and it rolled over, killing two men outright and trapping a 17-year-old boy. Despite heroic efforts to save the lad, he succumbed to the flames. Bismarck would later make news one last time when in 1918, as the U.S. fought World War I, a rise in anti-German feelings prompted the community to change its name to Hillsdale. Through the 1920s and 1930s, the McKinley Hill area experienced rapid population growth. As it did, the construction of roads, bridges, and streetcar lines in the area proceeded at a rapid pace, so did that of schools and businesses. Aberg's Fuel, Weir's Electric, and the Globe Ticket Company all grew out of the area and have left their mark in the hearts and minds of many. Positioned close to Tacoma's industries, the neighborhood continued to remain popular with the working class and many immigrant families. As World War II raged and war production brought jobs to Tacoma, housing was a critical issue. Along with Lincoln Heights and American Lake Gardens, the government also built Salishan to house the influx of workers and their families. Intended as temporary housing to be demolished following the war, the development opened in 1943 and offered all the comforts of modern living, minus one thing, telephones. War rationing forbade the use of copper wire for the installation of new telephone service. So, more creative methods were developed to contact friends down the street. Working together to make things happen is a timeless tradition on the East Side. From the volunteers who created the East Side Boys and Girls Club in 1960, to the creators of the gathering place, the people of the community have worked together to overcome all the odds. Today a new Shalashan community is beginning, and the rest of Tacoma is looking to this neighborhood for inspiration and hope for the future. Within the boundaries of the West End are some of Tacoma's greatest treasures and many of Tacoma's engineering marvels. Point Defiance has its beginnings back in 1866 when President Andrew Johnson signed an executive order that designated approximately 640 acres as a military reservation. This meant that development and settlement in the area was prohibited. For more than 20 years the land sat unused but as a result of intense lobbying by city leaders, the government allowed development as a park, but maintained complete ownership until 1905. Streetcar was the best way to get to the new park. The first lines opened in the 1890s, winding through and around numerous gullies and hills to reach the entrance. In 1907, the Nerdy's Bass were built just above the ferry landing. The structure boasted a 50 by 150 foot, 82 degree saltwater pool. This, alongside with the Funland rides, drew people from all around the area. Some of the park's first animal residents were buffalo at the turn of the century. 
Later, the zoo would become a favorite attraction in the park with a wide assortment of animals, including Dub Dub, a precocious little harbor seal who arrived in 1938. Outside the park, there was little development until 1887, when Dennis Ryan of St. Paul, Minnesota, decided that a large smelter works in Tacoma could take advantage of the Coeur d'Alene and Alaskan mines. In 1889, William R. Rust, an ore buyer from Colorado, arrived to manage the new smelter. Rust set up the first electrolytic copper refinery on the west coast and began to grow the small independent company town that still exists today and bears his name. In 1917, the smelter, now owned by American Smelting and Refining Company, built a new smokestack that reached a height of 571 feet, making it the tallest smokestack in the world. But in 1937, it was shortened to 562 feet during repairs, but remained one of the world's tallest until its demolition. At the early part of the century, Salmon Beach became a favorite spot for locals to spend lazy summer days. Relaxing in a rowboat and playing a ukulele was a favorite pastime for visitors and residents alike who enjoyed the solitude of this inaccessible beach. A little to the south, in 1903, a young man by the name of Aaron Titlow acquired a portion of land near a small beach and in 1911 built the Hesperides Resort Hotel, which became a very popular hangout for Fort Lewis soldiers during World War I. In 1912, the Northern Pacific began an ambitious project of tunneling two miles beneath Point Defiance from Commencement Bay to the Narrows. Three years and eight million dollars later, the Nelson Bennett Tunnel opened. Back near Titlow was the Sixth Avenue Ferry Dock, which was a vital link between Tacoma and the peninsula in pre-bridge days. The remnants of the dock are still present, but what no longer remains is Tacoma's own little bit of Hollywood. In 1924, H.C. Weaver built the Weaver Motion Picture Studios at Titlow. Hopes ran high for the studio and the budding Tacoma film industry, but none of the small number of films made there were a commercial success, and the studio was forced to close. The first structure to span the Narrows came in 1926 with the construction of suspended transmission lines from Cushman Dam to Tacoma. On May 24th of that year, President Calvin Coolidge pressed a key in the White House that started the flow of electricity across the mile and a quarter span. Engineers now dreamed of a bridge across the Narrows, and in 1938 began construction of the first Narrows Bridge, which opened on July 1st, 1940. She quickly became known as Galloping Gertie because of her unusual up and down motion in strong winds. But on November 7th, 130 days after her christening, Gertie's gallop turned into a dangerous twist. At about 10.45 a.m., she tore herself apart and collapsed into the water, leaving behind an indelible mark in the history books. Uh, the world knows Tacoma because of that famous bridge uh, going down in 1940. That, uh, um, for some reason, uh, everybody associates the city with that, and, and that's all they think about when they think about Tacoma. I think of bridges as symbols of cities. Um, the Brooklyn Bridge in New York, uh, uh, the Rialto in Venice, uh, the London Bridge, you know, all of these different bridges uh, epitomize cities, and the reputation of Tacoma it shouldn't be a, a Narrows Bridge, an, ac an accident waiting to happen, I guess. Calls for a replacement were immediate, but with war on the horizon, it would take years until that dream could be fulfilled. Like much of Tacoma during World War II, wartime housing also came to the West End. The Highlands, built in 1943, offered over 300 electrified homes to war workers. The post-war boom in America's economy saw developers look to the West End. With large areas of undeveloped land, they moved into the area swiftly. Restaurants, a drive-in movie theater, and even an airport flourished in the area. In 1947, Oswald's Flying Service operated out of Tacoma Field, located at South 19th and Mildred. In 1950, a new Narrows Bridge opened to traffic, and Tacoma was once again linked to the peninsula, this time for good. The first major retail shopping center to open was Westgate Village in 1954. Westgate's most prominent feature was Sibs Thriftway. A colossal store for its time, Sibs was the first in Tacoma with automatic doors and also featured modern electric cash registers. Following Westgate's example, Highland Hill opened in 1956 to serve that growing area. 
The new homes built in Skyline, Bridgeview, and Narrowmore reflected the new approaches to American style and comfort. As traffic grew to the West End, the need for road improvements was symbolized by North 21st, which remained largely unpaved until 1965. The demand for schools grew as well, and soon Geiger, Hunt, Truman, and Wilson would be built to handle the growing population. By the 1960s, the West End boom was in full swing, and undeveloped property was becoming scarce. In 1965, the construction of TCC gave Tacomans new educational opportunities and West Enders another source of pride. The West End was often referred to as Tacoma's last frontier, and in many ways, it was. But the West End's importance to Tacoma and who we are as a city is well established. For her first 100 years, Tacoma has managed to shone bright through boom and bust, war, tragedy, and triumph. But the character of the city is the spirit and tenacity of her people, the bonds of the community and the neighborhood. It's that spirit that has breathed life in Tacoma and will carry her forward into the light of her destiny. <laughs>